You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. everybody i love that music it gets me in the mood to talk some futures options welcome once again to twifo this week in futures options a program where as the name implies we kind of break down the week that was and in this case still is <laughs> from futures options rocking and rolling perspective my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as of course from the good old options insider radio network if you're listening to us just via the Twifo feed, maybe you found us over at CME or some other places. First off, welcome. Secondly, you're missing out on a whole bunch more. There's about 11 other shows you guys could be checking out on the old network. The easiest place to do that, of course, is to head on over to wherever you're listening to this fine program. Could be our website, CME website. Could be our mobile app. Could be iTunes, wherever you get your fine podcast programs and say, nay, I want the full kit and caboodle. I want to upgrade to the old network feed. Search for our name, Option Side of Radio Network, and you will find just that. It gets you all of our shows, daily news, all the other fun stuff, volatility breakdowns, what have you, so on and so forth. I guarantee you will not be wanting for options content. So check that out if you haven't already. And of course, for you hardcores who want to hear it live, we got you covered every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central via Mixler. Grab that link, set it, and forget it. I got a feeling a lot of you guys are paying attention to the market today because things are popping off. So let's get to it. Of course, hit us up. Questions, comments, insights. Uh, we do. Actually, yes, we do. 
like to hear from you guys. And joining me on the program today, my stalwart partner in crime, the yin to my yang, the dark side to my light side. I can go on forever. Instead, let's just bring him on. Mr. Nick Howard, the founder of Bantix Technologies and creator of a little platform I've used once or twice that I tend to like called Quickstrike. Mr. Nick, welcome back to Twifo. How are things in the land of all things Quickstrike? Hey, uh, doing okay. Um, just waiting for this day to end, to be honest with you. So let's get started. You're just always brimming with excitement when the show starts. Sir. Yes. It's dripping, well, it's a, dripping it's off a, the tongue. It, it, it's <laughs> cold out. It's cold outside. It's not supposed to be yet. You know, all that stuff. Uh, I'm not ready for this. So uh, let's, let's heat it up. But How you, about know, that? you know, what, you know of, where let, things are hot? You know where things are hot right now, Nick? The markets, that's guess. what I'll tell the you. The markets are hot, let's, that's right. Let's, things are crazy out here, so let's get to it. You may have been paying attention to a little thing that's called earnings this season. And yes, that does play over here on this show as well, because guess what? A lot of good earnings together, and we're talking blowing the doors off things, Nick. I mean, you're looking at different names. I don't care where you're looking, who reported last night. Microsoft, Google, you know, uh, CMG to the downside last week, earlier this week, I should say, uh, or other names out there, you know, Twitter. Everyone blowing the doors off their straddle, 2X, 3X, 4X. Amazon, of course, kind of leading the charge, just nonstop, just blowing the doors off things. So that's going to have an effect, and we're seeing that, surprise, surprise, uh, up there in the NASDAQ, uh, you know, first and foremost. This is one of the more active days in NASDAQ. We've seen, I think they're, they may have said it already. They were on point for a, uh, the biggest point, single point move, uh, a rally, I should say, really, since a, well over a year, year and a half. This is just a crazy day out here. Uh, as we're talking right now, uh, the NASDAQ up nearly 2%. Uh, I was up looking, looking up even more than that earlier in today, so it's given up a little bit of that rally. I think it was a pushing close to, it was getting up there <laughs> for a while there uh, earlier on some of our shows today. So all things NASDAQ have been crazy, as you might imagine. All this green on the screen has been just means just a vol apocalypse, a vol annihilation, call it what you will. What little vol there was to be found earlier this week, you know, we saw a little bit of vol creeping in to things like the S&P, where implied vol was getting into, oh, gasp. You know, shield your eyes, children, getting up into double digits, getting up to around 11 or so. And NASDAQ vol has kind of been up there in the mid to high teens for a while there. Uh, all of that kind of coming off the board today. NASDAQ vol kind of getting into the you know, low teens again. Uh, you know, S&P vol getting back into single digits as a result of this kind of just nonstop upside uh, that we're seeing out here uh, this week. So I thought, Nick, maybe we'd kick it off out here. A product we don't get to talk about a lot here on the show. Let's talk E-mini NASDAQ, because that one's always kind of uh, an interesting one. That's certainly where we're seeing a lot of the biggest action in terms of underlying move. Uh, it's going to be a lighter volume product than, of course, your E-mini S&P 500. So we'll get to that in a minute out there. But when things are rocking and rolling that much out there, we got to kind of start here. And it's been, like I said, an interesting, uh, interesting week, uh, you know, open interest. A good week for open interest out here in NASDAQ options, uh, up <laughs> roughly 50%. So people are all of a sudden awakening to a little bit of action out there in the E-mini NASDAQ. Surprise, surprise, the thing's rocking and rolling, open interest exploding. Uh, go figure. Uh, and where that action is coming from, it's kind of uh, evenly mixed uh, throughout the board. Let's go out here, I think, to the, uh, let's look here to the to the front month where we're seeing a lot of action out here. Uh, as well, actually, these are the weeklies because there's so much action out here in the in the weeklies out here. You're talking index, pretty much the name of the game is weeklies. If you're not looking at the weeklies, you're just looking at the serials or the quarterlies. You're missing pretty much 90 percent of the story because so much of the action out here is in the weeklies, and we're seeing that in the front week out here in the Nasdaq with about uh, the 61 halves. Uh, the futures right around 62.20 right now. 61 halves uh, were lighting it up this week to the tune of about 1,300 contracts, but it's kind of similar numbers. Across the board, depending where you're looking, 6,300 is also pretty active, uh, 1,200 of those on the board. Also, 60, 60, 60, 60 puts, interesting strike, also active with about 1,200 contracts uh, this week, kind of evenly scattered throughout the week. The 6,000, now we get to some of the even numbers, 6,000 puts, also pretty active, about 1,100 of those hitting the tape uh, this week. A good fair amount of these all opening this week, as you might expect, open interest kind of exploding this week. You're going to see OI increases on a lot of these strikes. The 6,100 calls, also pretty active, about 1,000 and change. And we get a little bit uh, a little bit farther out. Let's go out here all the way, Nick. Dear I go that far out to week two, <laughs> where we find uh, the 61 halves 
Uh, she actually were not actually number one. It's 5,800 puts, 5,800. Zero, zero. Interesting strikes out here, of course, uh, with about 1,000 of those hitting the tape. Again, pretty evenly sc- uh, scattered, but it looks like the lion's share coming, actually, on Tuesday, not today, which is kind of interesting. So some interesting drivers uh, throughout the week, almost all of that opening here. And let's go even farther out. Let's go, let's go to Crazy Town. Uh, let's go out here all the way to early next year where we got, what are these, 65 hundred calls just uh lighten it up here this week as well uh 6500 calls actually it was like a vertical maybe the 6300 6500 out here in uh, march was lighting it up to the tune of 500 a day wednesday and thursday each so a total of about a thousand uh going up on this week um actually looks like that's closing so maybe someone it looks like a straightly a vertical, 6,300, 6,500 call vertical. Someone deciding perhaps, uh, even despite this week's move, uh, did not, didn't do it today. They did it Wednesday and Thursdays. Maybe they were a little early on the game there. They decided to close this vertical out. We didn't quite hit this level, but, you know, huge move, couple percent move here in the underlying. This vertical might have looked uh, kind of nice. Again, we don't know if they were shorted or not, so maybe it was a savvy move. Uh, but still, interesting stuff. So all that coming off the tape, uh, maybe as we're seeing uh, some interesting stuff. So a lot of interesting stuff to parse out here. Really quick, let's go a little bit farther out here, Nick, as well. This is, of course, March of uh of next year actually so broke down the 6500s uh, a lot of just a lot of interesting paper across the board we don't get a chance to talk nasdaq nick so maybe we'll start hey if anything caught your eye obviously underlying move gonna be a big catcher a big driver this week but also what'd you see out here in the skew because we haven't really had a chance to plumb the depths of nasdaq skew here on the show yet well uh i will say this much i think that uh you know, just looking at the report itself and that there's a 50% increase in the open interest. So that's telling you something. And that all that all had to occur prior to today. So, um, you know, maybe with, uh, with the rumblings of the earnings uh, being positive, uh, that, you know, there was already some play in the market with people getting, uh, getting into some options. Because if you look at overall, I mean, the open interest is really nothing in the NASDAQ. So uh, that part of it is always sort of telling the fact that 22,000 increase in open interest is 50% change. And, um, you know, that's actually really surprising to be honest with you. So, uh, it will, it will be, uh, um, a number today might match that. You never know, given the fact that we had such a big run up. So I I'm sure there were some people that I'm, I'm trying, you know, what I want to look at, I got to look at the change in overall, whether in calls and puts and how this run up was going. So that's the part that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to find here, but I, I don't want to jump off the Twio report itself. But uh, as far as skew, no skew has changed from from last week. So I think it's uh, it, you know the puts got a little bit more um, a little bit more bid in the short dated stuff, but really that's irrelevant because that's under a week, so it doesn't really count when it comes to uh, when it comes to that. Um, but you know, so I don't find I don't see anything super interesting. Uh, vols bid today or this week, and uh, you know that makes sense given how much we've what, how much you've moved. But it was bid prior to today, so the change for today is really not um, present. So it was all happening. Uh, you, you start to go out a few uh, a few expirations, and you're seeing uh, stuff bid a little bit today. But but you know you got a lot of that bid that happened prior to today. So I guess you know it's if I if we look at the if we look at the volume numbers for today, right, you're only looking at really like 14,000, 15,000 contracts. And when you consider, um, you know, what it was um, the previous day, you had that much in just the short dated option. So that's probably, you're probably right. Probably where a lot of the action was, was in that one or two day. And it really encompassed earnings perfectly. Right. So, I mean, that that's, like you said, that seems to be the play. So if you want to get out here and it's really not even like trading options anymore, you know, it, uh, it's like trading a, a binary or a short term future. When you're doing those, uh, when you're doing those expirations that are under one, two or three days, you're really looking at just a directional play. So it's like, how much are you willing to spend in order to take a shot at something going up or down? And, and really it looks like a lot of the action took place uh, with people just trying to get in the market and see what would, you know, you see Amazon come out and you go, okay, if they're going up, then, and there was just a big, there was just a, there was, there was just, I'm reading this book called Four, and it's a, it's a book by an NYU professor, but there was just an article on it recently just saying how the Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and one other one, I forget the other one, believe it or not, I'm only on the first part of it, it was Amazon. But, you know, those are really driving 
what's going on in the market. And apparently, obviously, that's what's driving the rally in the market. So uh, we, we want to keep an eye on this next week because I'm going to guess that we're not going to see the same kind of volume because you're going to see short dated stuff that was in action because of earnings or if earnings is still going on next week. I don't know because I don't pay attention to the that part of the market so much. Um, it'll be uh, it'll be um, something we have to pay attention to going forward uh, with the Nasdaq because I'm sure that the CME would love to see this contract get going as well. Yeah, you know, it's been uh, obviously we took a look at a lot of that in some of our other shows that part of the market, you know, an earnings season, uh, a big driver for a lot of interest, a lot of activity, a lot of vol often and a lot of other interest, a lot of interest in the market. And it's always nice when that kind of spills over in some of our other shows, and other products in particular. Let's talk about uh, E-mini S&P. That's where a lot of action is lighting it up today and up again this week uh, e-mini also kind of just rocketing obviously a much bigger product so it's kind of hard to replicate that 50 percent oi jump but still almost 19 percent. that's nothing to sneeze at 18.8 percent in a rocking contract like e-mini that's that's some good oi growth so that just shows you e-mini was lighting it up and that's not all today a good chunk of that might be today but that's not all today it's been active all week uh, pretty much so kind of pick your poison the ironic thing actually is the e-mini it's kind of a bit of the laggard today. You know, it's only up about, oh, about a quarter of a percent, or actually net on the week, only up about a quarter of a percent. Uh, today's move, it was nowhere near, uh, you know, the scope that we're seeing out there and really the tech-heavy NASDAQ. It was NASDAQ where the, where the action was just so focused. Everyone else was kind of catching the, you know, the rising tide lift all, lifts all boats, but then the S&P just wasn't, uh, wasn't anywhere near what the NASDAQ's doing. Yet still an active week out there. Vol coming off, as you might imagine, not as aggressive as some of the other names, but still... They don't need much of an excuse to crush vol in the S and P. They they see a tick and they just crush it. And you know, I was talking to people on one of our other shows today, and they were saying that they seemed like there was this inflection point uh, recently in the S and P where all of a sudden you know, vol was ticking up for the better part of the week, and then everyone decided yet again, you know, we don't want to hold this anymore, and they just started crushing it, and they're crushing the futures again today, and all the other fun stuff going on out there in terms of volatility uh, in the space. And so vol off a bit out here, longer term, not as much obviously because there's only so much they can crush. Of the long-term vol out there in the S&P. Going out there to what was lighting it up, it's kind of a pick your poison. You know, you guys watch the E-mini, you guys know how active it is, uh, you know, pushing, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands uh, of contracts out here. And uh, number one with a bullet, uh, the weeklies are kind of where the action is yet again in the S&P, in the indexes. You know, everywhere you look, it's just all, all weeklies. Uh, there's so many weeklies, you can kind of pick your poison. They're all fairly active this week. I guess if you got to pick number one with a bullet, we got to go out to the no week three. That's where the 2350 put. I remember we're right, right now we're right around 2580 out here in the S&P. So the 23 half put, number one with a bullet this week out here in the S&P 500 E Mini, doing about 25,000 contracts. Yeah, that's pretty decent paper. That's almost as much in that, in that uh, and a couple of these strikes as there are all in the Nasdaq, obviously. But still, a lot of action to parse out here. And a lot of this actually was Wednesday, 14, 000, almost 15,000, so over half of that 25,000 going up on Wednesday. Not a lot actually lighting it up today, only about uh, 600 or so contracts, which is kind of surprising. But again, those are very out-of-the-money uh, options, so maybe not surprising that the 23 halves aren't carrying the charge uh, today. 2600s, also pretty active. That strike makes a little bit more sense, given the fact that we're flirting with that handle right now out there uh, in the futures. Uh, that one about doing about 22,000, so not that far behind the others. Uh, about 8,000, again, going up on Wednesday. So Wednesday, kind of the most active uh, day and then we drop back here to actually week one here in uh, october a week uh, actually week four october excuse me and uh this is the front week though <laughs> and this is the uh 2575 so pretty much front week at the money calls here doing about twenty one thousand contracts the lion's share surprise surprise coming today about seven thousand and change so about a third of that coming today as we're seeing people piling into these weeklies because of these moves out here in the indices. Also seeing about 21,000 and change of the 25 half puts, 21,500 to be 21,500 to be precise. Uh, the lion's share of those actually coming on Wednesday, not today, 7,500 of those. So about a third again coming back there on Wednesday. Then it's kind of just a pick your poison, 20,000 plus of all of the following, 2570 calls, 2560 puts. Uh, you can look out to other months, 20 half puts out here. In uh, Nov week one, also pretty active, nearly 20,000 of these. So just a lot of paper lighting it up here uh, across the board. I'm looking here for any any extreme outliers that may uh, may catch the fancy out here. We already talked about the 23 half puts. I don't see a lot of uh, crazy town paper here. Uh, maybe indicative of just how much is going on this week. Everyone's staying 
a little bit, uh, maybe a little more, a little less extreme in <laughs> some of their bets. Mr. Uh, Mr. Nick, what's catching your eye out here? We were talking a little bit about skew uh, earlier today. What's going on out here uh, in the quick skew perspective? Uh, we like to break it down, call wing and put wing, not just net. And that's why the quick skew is so cool, as well as what else is catching your eye out here, aside from just the eye-popping volume going on today? Well, you know, uh, the skew has actually moved quite a bit in the indexes here. So we see the calls definitely got offered quite a bit this week, and the puts were bid. And we're, and that's generally the case when you're looking from we, – we're going to skip that seven-day option, but I'm going to start looking at, like, the 14-day, the 21-day, uh, the 28-day, the 34-day. You, you see – fairly big jumps in that skew. And, and again, you know, that's because of the grind up, I would imagine. And, and, and that's going to be the case probably going forward, but you know, it, it would, it would be, it would be uh, a pleasure to see a big push up like we saw in the NASDAQ from a percent standpoint to shake the tree on some of these short calls that I'm sure people have up there. But again, if they're doing coverage and stuff like that, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal to them, but, uh, but yeah, stuff, the, the, the curve definitely tilted, um, even further with uh, the calls offered in the puts bid. Um, I'm just amazed, to be perfectly honest with you, you have, you, you mentioned it already, you have an 18% increase in open interest across the board. Now, as you said, that could probably all be accounted for uh, in the contracts that expiring today. But But the fact that there's just a continual pouring in of trading into those contracts, I mean, the weeklies... We are going to see the weeklies in every product, in every every asset class and every product is going to be like this. It's just a matter of time. It's once people get comfortable with it, once people understand that it's there, once it's more integrated in these trading platforms, not – the big problem with them is they're, they're kind of – they're treated as a separate product in a lot of cases. So sometimes they're hard to find. All the, the platforms are starting to list them, you know, days to expiration uh, order. So that's going to make it a little bit easier for people to find that. But once – there won't even be weeklies anymore. They're going to start calling it seven day, 14 day, 21 day option. And that's probably how we should think about it. Right. Cause the weekly just makes it sound like there's some mysterious thing to it, but it's really, it's, you have an option that expires every two or three days around here. And, and really what you got now is you don't have, you have, you have stuff that acts like binaries. So that's how I look at it. I look at it as many, few, you know, you have many futures on the many futures basically, right? Because you got low premium bets that you can make and you're saying, Hey, look, I'm willing to spend this kind of money um, for a chance for this to go one way or another. And, uh, and, and that's kind of how I see it. And, but it, it certainly looks like people are selling into this rally because they're probably doing coverage and it makes sense because um, the market's up so much. They're glad to deliver at strikes that are above. Right. Don't you think? I mean, and then they're going to protect their downside. So I don't see the skew changing anytime soon. And, and maybe it makes complete sense that it's this tilted. Yeah, you know, that's always been kind of the use case for uh, for all things, you know, uh, S&P or just in equity and index options in general. People have no reticence uh, to give away premium to the upside and to buy it to the downside. So, yeah, that skew doesn't I mean, the shape is going to evolve. The slope's going to evolve. But the underlying shape, I should say, doesn't really change. The slope will evolve. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing a little bit out there now. Interesting stuff. You know, we could probably talk indices a lot for the rest of the show. We probably should squeeze in a few others uh, here. But, yeah, indices kind of just uh, stealing so much thunder out here. Let's go really quick to one of our other stalwarts here. Good old WTI. See what was lighting up out here in crude. You know, this would have been the headliner for most other weeks. You know, crude up nearly 4% on the week. 54 handle, getting in the mid-50s range now. Uh, so I think we're maybe actually off the check with, I think maybe actually above that ceiling that Matt put in there on 52 and a half. So maybe, maybe, maybe this is a sign. Who knows? Crude bulls get excited or not, depending on how you feel <laughs> out there. But yeah, 54 right around that level out here in the futures. Uh, all this upside means a uh, continual squeezing on the vol. If you just thought that crude vol sponge couldn't get squeezed anymore, I got bad news for you. It did yet again this week coming off pretty much uh, across the board, wherever you're looking out here. In the futures, we saw a little juice coming out of the old sponge this week. In terms of what was lighting it up, well, actually, open interest, a fairly robust. I mean, it's no, it's no 19 or 50 percent like we saw on the indices, but up fairly, fairly, fairly robust 4 percent out here in WTI. Nothing to sneeze at uh, on a, on a given week. And number one with a bullet out here. Uh, I'm not talking weeklies. Weekly is not the story in crude, as we said many times here uh, on the show. WTI for whatever reason, the weeklies. It's not where the action is. It's in the cereals. It's in the front month. Or in this case, it's the quarterly. It's the Dece. Dece uh, 2017 lighting it up. Number one with a bullet 
And we said it before, they like their even money strikes out here in WTI. And they like them again this week to the tune of the 50 puts, lighting it up. Total of about 32,000 contracts. Pretty active all week long, quite frankly. Nearly 9,000 on Tuesday, 7,300 on Wednesday and Thursday. Today, about 6,000 so far. So uh, pretty active days. Monday, a little bit lighter. Uh, bo- a total of about, I said, 32,000. About five, almost 6,000 of that opening. So a little bit of opening action. You know, we've seen for a while there a little bit of almost just a lot of churn in WTI where people are just kind of just net doing nothing on strikes. It's kind of It was kind of an odd run there for a couple of weeks, and now this week we're seeing a little more action, a little bit more open interest increases here, including the, uh, the 54s, also pretty active. Again, at the money strike now. About 20,000 of those lighting it up. The lion's share coming today, about 6,000 lighting it up today, about 2,000 and change of those opening. And then also we saw the uh, 52 puts getting some action, about 20,000 of those. Again, about 5,000 and change. The lion's share come, actually coming today. Actually, no, I take that back. 7,800 came up on Wednesday. So the lion's share actually coming on Wednesday, over a third uh, coming uh, on Wednesday there alone. And then the double calls, 55 calls, with about 19,000 and change, rounding out our top uh, some of our top numbers here, with about a lion's share of 9,000 coming today. So almost half. Uh, coming up in today's action again about a couple thousand net opening so net opening on most of these strikes which is interesting as opposed to kind of just the the frothy churn we've been seeing out here for uh, a while of course most of the action was in the d's here you can go a little bit farther out 45 puts in uh, june of next year also uh, pretty active with a bush i'm sorry jan Jan of next of next year active with about oh about twelve thousand contracts going up. We also saw for all you crude bulls out here, Dees twenty eighteen par calls, one hundred calls, pretty active. About twenty three hundred of those lighting it up this week. Uh, spanned over three days, Wednesday, Thursday, with about a thousand each, and then two hundred and change on uh, on Tuesday. So twenty three hundred. Uh, all of that, actually, a good chunk of that opening on the week. Not all opening, so worthy of note. A little bit of a uh, little bit of back and forth action there as well. Puts also not to be forgotten. We go all the way out to June of 2019. We see a 1800 of the 35 puts. So people out there concerned or specking on continued contraction out there in the crude space. They haven't gone away yet. Someone trading the 35 puts. Uh, pretty actively out here this week. So, Nick, kind of an interesting week out here. You know, we've been you know, debating whether crude could extend its run for a while. Looks like it has. Unfortunately for premium buyers, that means more juice getting squeezed out of that sponge. Since we're talking premium and vol, what did you see out here in, in the quick skew in, in WTI this week, sir? Well, unfortunately, nothing too interesting, right? We got we got our continued grind. I think we're sort of have a sliding range at this point, right? Because... Uh, um, you know, there's really not any change that curve sort of sliding up as we go, as we, as we make our move in the, in the futures. Right. So that's a fairly typical way that vol will, will often move. Um, and, uh, and if we, uh, if we look out on the curve, we see, we don't see much change at all. So we see a little bit of a bit in the puts maybe as we go out, but really nothing significant, nothing that you would, uh, write home about. Um, you know, I think along the same lines, we might mention the fact that, you know, you're you're talking about WTI, but you should probably mention Brent as well. Brent printed 60 for the first time uh, since 2015, and you, uh, people who have listened for a while might recall that we had we had talked about the WTI Brent uh, spread, where there was the possibility of it approaching uh, zero. Right. So right now that front month contract is about six dollars so those trades are probably uh off uh, into the you know been flushed down the toilet for the most part i would imagine because a lot of that was based on the rhetoric about taxing uh, taxing oil that was coming into the country that type of stuff along with the rest of the rhetoric that just sort of sometimes moves the market and doesn't really mean anything um but uh you know nothing you know nothing really tremendously of interest you you you, you did say the uh, the par calls you know out there in december 2 you also see the 90 calls traded and that was a that was an opening in that as well so 75s traded a a bunch today um so you you are getting some interest on the upside i'm always curious as to why those are trading i'm not really sure they might be part of a bigger spread um but uh you know, as far as anything super interesting, I think the one thing I would take away from this is that the curve is not changing as we rally. We have a four percent rally. The curve doesn't really change, and it just sort of, it just sort of went its way. It's just sliding along. So, for those who uh, aren't necessarily 
completely familiar with, uh, you know, volatility or new to options, you know, sometimes the vol curve will keep a shape and then just sort of slide along the futures price um, as the as the market moves uh, um, up and down. And, uh, and, you know, we didn't see much change in the term structure either. So all in all, you know, not, not, not a tremendous um, amount of things that are very interesting out here. A uh, tremendous move this week in gold as well. We're talking about it a little bit, obviously. It didn't uh, continue a little bit of a downside. Not huge, five handles out here. So till, still around that 1275 level back where we were a couple of weeks ago. We saw that crazy upside gold spread uh, going up. I don't see any signs of our friend coming back to play this week. He's already got on what he wants. So he's got his vertical with uh, some 2x upside crazy 3,000 strike kicker. So he's a happy camper, I suppose. Uh, let's move on to what we saw actually out here this week. Gold ball coming off yet again. Uh, so if you were hoping for a little bit of a reprieve, a little bit of gold ball, the bump, we talked about how it's kind of it's kind of plumbing the depths, historic depths out here in terms of volatility cones and everything else. Uh, you didn't get that rebound. You saw more squeeze coming out this week out here in terms of what was lighting it up, what was number one with the bullet. Also, open interest pretty strong again this week, up about 4% out here in gold. Seems to be the magic number across a lot of a lot of products that aren't NASDAQ or indeed even the uh, E-mini. Uh, those are just kind of uh, outliers, extreme outliers, shall we say, this week number one with a bullet given the fact that we're at 1275 you think it'd be there but no it's actually the 12 half puts uh coming up here what are these these are decent 12 half puts uh with a total of about 7400 lighting it up pretty even throughout the week about 2400 coming today i guess it's about a third uh coming up here uh today uh t about 1500 of that actually opening or so so a net opening here on the week also saw about 6,000 of the 1,300 calls, so those uh, even calls still still pretty active. About 6,000 and change net unched from an OI perspective on the week, so back and forth, 1,300s. They giveth and they taketh away pretty much all week long as uh, people net doing nothing on that strike, which is kind of interesting. Also saw about 5,500 of the 1,220 puts. Those are a little bit farther out of the money. It's kind of interesting that they're that active this week. 5,500 of those. Uh, the lion's share coming Thursday. About half of those coming on Thursday. Net about 1,500 opening. Or should be closing uh, on the week. And then about 5,000, 5,100 of the 13 quarter calls. Also lighting it up this week. About 2,400, a little over more than half. Uh, a little, actually, about a little, bit, a little bit less than half here. Going up on Tuesday, 2448. On Tuesday, the rest of the week. Uh, kind of evenly split, and about 1,800 that, of that opening. So some opening paper here on the 13 quarters. Let's also keep an eye out here, see if we see any, uh, any, any other crazy outliers like to come across our screen. Nothing quite as, as just, nothing's going to ever come, come that close to what we saw a couple weeks ago, Nick. But we do see the 1550s going up about 1,000 times. These are the June 2018 1550s lighting it up uh, actually about a thousand times. No change to OI out here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so just a thousand of those printing on Monday. Uh, other than that, not a heck of a lot in terms of outliers. Oh, a one lot, I should say. One lot of the Dees 2009 2500 calls going up. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. Nick. Uh, I guess that's my cue. Uh, yeah, I still couple comments so there was uh dave i think it's dave lerman over at the cme did a, a video this week and he talked about this the first time in forever uh where all of the major commodities are trading below or into single digit volatilities so uh i'm still gonna toot the horn of the gold vol as being um you know, I, I'm treating this the same way we've been talking about it this we're at, we're at the bottom um part of the range again you know, the market's going to fluctuate, you know, up and down. But if you go look at this, we're at the bottom part of range or in the lower, lower third of a range. So there's going to be some opportunity to trade here as well, trading toward the upside. And like I always say, um, I like puts and I like them. There's, a, there's vol plays here now. There's hedge vol plays, I think. When vol is this low, you can start doing stuff that's hedged that makes sense because uh, at some point, and again, you could say that forever when vol is low, at some point it's going to happen. But um, I still, even though it's low and it could go a little bit lower, I still think uh, you know that trade in and of itself works. Um, I'm looking out at the block for today, a block trades for today, and a lot of... Um, buying of the 1325 calls and selling of the 1200 puts. So that trade seemed to show up quite a bit in here. 
uh, today, and I'm also seeing this same, seeing some strangle purchases of the 1214.25 strangle. So, you know, people are trading. Yeah, the the open interest not up that much, but at the same time, this is a pretty good million contracts. They're up over a million. I'm not sure when the last time that was, but I'm sure there's some mention of that somewhere in the CME documentation. So the fact that we're million contracts in the gold, um, pretty good. But you know, no nothing interesting from a SKU standpoint. The calls got a little little bit cheaper. Puts kind of stayed fairly steady. But I think gold's the I think gold's the commodity to watch. I think the way the futures trade the way the future has traded, uh, the way the vol is um, priced, it's low. You got single bit you got single digits under 10 now for the 90 day contract. It just doesn't make doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If you look at that over a period of time, the, the, you're, you're hitting those ranges. I'm pretty sure you're hitting those ranges. So that's something we'll have to look at for next week. I'll look at the, uh, and, and people out on, uh, or listening who are listening to this next week, you can look at the CME groups, got the uh, quick strike report out there called the vol, the vol, vol to vol report expected range. You can go take a look and see based on a current volatility, what does, um, what does that move, uh, encompass. So I, I'm sure that we're doing pretty good here in terms of hitting some decent ranges here. Let's take a look uh, let's, why we can't. So I'm looking at the December contract. I want to go a little bit further out. I'm going to go to the 90 day contract. And uh, so quarter of a year, we have a volatility of around 10%. So you have a uh, one standard deviation range of somewhere between about 1215 all the way to 1340. And, you know, we've traded up that high as pretty recently. So it's, um, it's the, I think it's, I think it's a good, I think it's a good place to look. And just from a pure trading options from a volatility standpoint, anyway, that's all I'm, I'm talking around in circles. I talk about it all the time. I, I think that this is, uh, uh, unfortunately a very interest, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it. It's really interesting from a market standpoint that the vols are so low and, you know, we just keep, you know, we're either very rangy or we keep going in one direction. So, um, I think you just got to pay attention, right? Because this is when you this is when you can get lulled to sleep. Yeah, you can. But uh, in terms of what wasn't sleeping, we can look at our winners and losers for the week. Spoiler alert: It wasn't Nasdaq. <laughs> Nasdaq had an active day, but not not on the week. It was uh, distant compared to some of these others. Number one big winner for the week again. This is just underlying pure underlying moves, not ball or open interest or anything else like that. We could do that. But that's a little bit more involved and a little bit more puppy. Uh, terrifying for some people. So we keep it strictly to the winners and losers on uh, the big uh, underlying for the week. Number one with the bullet, Lumber, over 5%, 5.06 on the upside. Followed number two, Arbob, up 4.5%. And then our old friend, Class 3 Milk. I think we have a question about that later. A uh, four and a quarter percent to the upside. NASDAQ, net, net on the week, the E-mini. NASDAQ, only up 1.67% on the week. So good, strong day, but net on the week. Uh, distant, what number is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's number 10. So I made the top 10 just barely. Uh, Eakin out corn up a little bit more than 1%. Looking to the downside, what was having a rough week? It was iron ore, about five and a quarter percent off here. A net gas, number two, off 4.63%. We're talking NAS gas last, NAS gas last week uh, with Derek here on the show coming off a bit again, 4.63%. Number three, rough rice. 4.16, and we drop off a bit. Uh, oats and copper tied for 4 and 5, about 1.95% off to the downside. All right, with the winners and losers set up, let's get some of your uh, feedback onto the show. Time for some futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for Futures Options Feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to your segment, the Futures Options Feedback, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, questions, comments, insights, uh, 
Slams against Nick. All that fun stuff. I'm just kidding on that one. Who could ever do such a thing? All right. That's my job here on the old show. Let's kick things off. I've um, got an interesting range uh, of questions here this week. By the way, if you're listening live, on, hit us up. Go ahead. We'll see if we can try to squeeze you in. we got a lot of, a lot of questions here, though. Um, you know, we were just talking... We were just talking milk, Nick, so maybe I'll, I'll jump around. I'm going to start there. This, uh, this fun little question from Danubs. <laughs> I like that handle. Or Danubs. Say it how you will. He says, quite simply, can I buy options on milk? And the answer is yes. You also can sell them if you were inclined. I think he meant can I trade options on milk. I'm going to assume it's that way. But yes, you can trade them. You can buy them or sell them. Uh, we've joked about it before on the show, but these things uh, do trade in fact, I'm looking right now at the Class 3 milk options here on the old Quick Strike. You guys can follow along, by the way, uh, with all the reports Nick and I do for the most part here. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. That's where you can go to really uh, just look at all these numbers we're looking at right now and see for yourself. Don't take our word for it. Go generate the report for yourself. And you can pull up, if you were so inclined, pull up Class 3 milk. And you would see that they actually did uh, some decent volume this week, about 150-odd contracts. So there you go. So not the most liquid thing on the planet, but they're trading. And there's actually about 60-odd thousand contracts uh, open out here, 60, 60, almost 62,000. So it's got some decent OI. i got to imagine that trading is a little bit sporadic. So you can trade them uh, if you want. And if you sounds like if you want to buy them, you are, if you are so inclined, you can buy them. Just be, be aware that a total of 150 contracts traded this week. I don't know, Mr. Nick, anything for our friend Denubs who wants to know, can he buy options on milk? Yeah, I think those are simple questions to answer because all you got to do is log into the free version of QuickStrike and you'll see every all the products that are available, right? So there's really no you know, you can you can find out without having to listen to the show. We want you to listen to the show, but go up there and look and you do the hit the drop down and you'll see all the products um all the products that are available. And if there's liquidity and no pun intended for the milk, you know, we're probably uh, showing it. And, and that, that market's actually pretty, um, pretty, I, feel, I don't know if odds the right word. We'll call it oddball. I think what happens is they stop trading. They don't trade a, a bunch of the, uh, the, the front contract doesn't trade a bunch after a certain period of time, after when it gets to a, be a particularly short dated option for, and, and I remember I went to a dairy conference and they talked a little bit that, about that, how it just the way it, it delivers and that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so if you're looking to get into options, that's probably not the place to go because you got people that are hedging in and know the market a little bit better than you. I'm not exactly sure that there's a lot of information disseminated in the, in the dairy market. Um, so yeah, dairy, not the uh, place to go for your most, uh, your most active <laughs> product. But if that's your, if that's your bag. If you're a dairy man, have at it there, Mr. Or perhaps Mrs. Uh, Denubs. If you want to buy, go forth and buy. Enjoy. All right. Uh, we got, we got interesting themes. Like they got thematic questions this week, Nick. We got people asking a similar type thing. Let's go to this combo here. We got one here from BX vets. He says, what's your favorite cell signal? And then Belobo11 says, kind of a similar theme, what was your most recent and promising buy signal? <laughs> and how did you come across it? Uh, I can answer both of these kind of the same way in that I've never, I'm not really a huge uh, chartist. I'm not a huge technical guy. I, I think I talked about that some of our other shows, maybe not on this show, but I think the reason I really had a lot of that beaten out of me was over years, you know, hedging options you know, as a market maker. You do a lot of gamma scalping, and so you use a lot of tools to try to figure out the appropriate stops and limits for your gamma scalps. And we didn't find a lot of tools that really worked very well for that. So that kind of, and we tried all of them, <laughs> as you might imagine. Uh, so we it kind of uh, beat a lot of a lot of uh, the use case for me, and a lot of the interest, and a lot of the faith in technical analysis out of me. And I know there are diehards out there who support that, and more power to you if you enjoy it and you find it profitable for you. Then go forth. It's just never been my bag. If I had to use a tool, it's kind of what I alluded to earlier, and Nick talked about last week when it came to gold, which is volatility cones. At the end of the day, uh, that kind of data is kind of hard to argue with. And what that does, it's effectively, think of it, it's kind of analogous to, for you chartists out there, it's like a Bollinger Band, but for volatility. It'll show you kind of where your volatility levels are stacking up, could be realized, could be implied, whatever your flavor of cone is that you choose to, to use. <laughs> we don't judge. And then you can look at that on a historical basis. You can see if it's one standard deviation above some historical average or mean, or it's one standard de deviation below, or whatever you know number kind of you're looking at there, two standard deviations, whatever the case may be. And that could give 
give you some inkling of hey, you know, maybe maybe my my vol I'm buying right now maybe a little bit a uh, little bit expensive, maybe it's a little bit cheap. I want to buy more that sort of thing. So maybe our friend out there in fluid milk before he buys some options, maybe he should look at some vol cones out there see if it's cheap or not for him. So that's kind of if I had to pick, you know, a quote unquote seller buy signal that I tend to use the most, Nick, it probably would be that. But I'm again, I'm not a huge chartist. What do you have to say here for? BX Vets and Blobo uh, 11. Are you a chartist, Nick? Well, I, I mean, I pay attention to stuff, but, but one thing I've been seeing more of and, and one thing that I think actually <clears throat> might have some merit is, uh, is paying attention to the, to the max strikes in open interest in the, in the closer to expiration contracts. Because what happens there, people, are, people have open positions in those strikes. And what tends to happen um, as you near those strikes, you have to start your, your gamma gets your gamma, your gamma is highest at the, at the money strike, right? So people tend to defend that strike or tend to trade around that where, because they get either big negative numbers or big positive numbers from a futures underlying position standpoint. So, um, I like those too. So, and, and I see a lot of, a lot of guys, uh, a lot of foreign guys that trade the foreign exchange. I see that being a pretty, um, typical thing that they, uh, that they do. Um, they're always paying attention to the open interest. They'll look to see and put on particular risk reversals at that point. And I think um, somebody actually just talked to me. They sent me this chart where there was a big, um, it was a, a futures chart that had the different levels of open interest for the different strikes on it. And it was a way to kind of look at different barriers. So I would say, take a look at that one as well. And we'll be having a chart that's going to come out something um, where you'll see the underlying futures and then, and then you'll see uh, um, some open interest information on that futures chart, which I don't think you see in a lot of places. Nick, you you diehard chartist you. Who knew? Who knew such a chartist you are? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. We got um, yeah, a couple of similar questions here, similar themed at least questions, not not to charting, but to, they have a theme to them. Uh, yeah, Admiral Tweezers wants to know, do you foresee any innovations in market making such that it might become less centralized or more crowdsourced? And then Michael, Michael Bazzello wants to know, what's the most valuable lesson you learned as a market maker? that you would tell retail traders uh, trading options. So again, themes this week. Everyone wants to know about market making. Um, I guess I'll start with the last one, uh, the, the innovations. Less centralized and more crowdsourced. I have to say no. I think of any trend we've seen, it's just more centralization, more kind of aggregation of liquidity around fewer and fewer providers for a variety of reasons. All the small providers have pretty much just left the business or been forced out. The risk is too much. The costs are too much. The regulatory onus too much for a small player. I've heard differing figures, but the ballpark somewhere, you want to come in and start any decent size options, prop shop, market making, call it what you will, operation these days. You hear ballpark, ballpark 10 to 20 million in the low end for startup costs and everything, technology and everything else. So it's not an insignificant proposition. It's not something that you can kind of come off the street and start doing. So that does not point towards less centralization. It's not, it points towards more. And forth. And that's exactly what we've seen. There are pretty much a handful of players out there that have monopolized most of the liquidity uh, out there because that's just the only ones who can really afford to do it anymore. It would be interesting if we could have some sort of crowdsourced uh, you know, liquidity. You can argue – and some of the more liquid names out there that they are, they're so tight, they're effectively like limit order books and people are kind of, the customers are providing liquidity in that sense out there. So maybe in the, some of those names you can make an argue, some of the big indices and, you know, some of the big equities that trade pretty actively and pretty tightly, uh, those names, maybe you can make that argument that it's happening. But outside of those, it's a very limited spectrum, a very limited universe of names. I, I don't see, you know, some of these smaller names that don't trade as actively, you know, your class three milk, for example. You know, getting a lot of crowdsourced liquidity <laughs> anytime uh, soon. And um, well, I'll save the lesson one for a second. Mr. Uh, Nick, what, uh, what would you like to well, – well, I'll let you chime in on both of these if you want. we got to say here from Michael and Mr. Tweezers. Uh, crowd, crowdsourced to me means a lot of people putting small bids and offers in there and a lot of people disappearing when it, the market gets spooky. So – do I think it'll go that way? I don't necessarily think it would go that way. You might get a crowdsource for people that where something might trade or might, where it might be, but I don't think you're going to get from a market standpoint. I would tend to agree with you on those and that comment um, that it's that it's more limited into um, to the bigger players. I mean, their their job is to provide the liquidity, right? So at that point, and you see them disappear from the market when it gets spooky as well. But I don't think you see it as much. Um, 
if you want me to go on and answer is like, what do you, what lesson did you learn from market making? I, I probably it, can sir. give up. I could probably do a whole show and then another show, uh, on that one. But, um, I would say that, uh, the biggest thing is you, uh, you have to realize that, uh, you're not as smart as you think you are most of the time. And, uh, also, when you make a decision to get out of something or to, if, especially to get out of something, when you make the decision to get out of something, don't let what looks like a potential favor, a, a, a change of the market or a favorable situation, you know, affect your decision to, to either cover or, um, or, you know, break a bad trade or whatever the case may be, because those are, that's the biggest problem that you'll give yourself is just letting, um, letting yourself get fooled in, 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 into what was a good, thoughtful decision. Like, you know, you, you gotta, when the market's not open, you gotta look at your position. You gotta look and see what you like. You gotta look and see where you get out. You gotta look and see what you'd be satisfied because you're, you're less emotional at that time. So pay attention to that and don't be quick to pull stuff where you're, uh, especially where you're taking a profit or uh, uh, minimizing a loss. And I look at, you know, what I, what I learned in market making, you know, I, I tend to break it down into a couple of different camps and, you know, uh, the, 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 the the professionals, the market makers tend to, and that's, that's what they kind of beat into my brain early on, look at things from a vol perspective, vol skew, net vol, vega. That's kind of how you learn to trade because you realize very quickly you really are a volatility trader. A lot of retail still are in that delta camp. They look at it as purely a directional spec or hedge on an underlying movement. That's kind of the only way they see and utilize options, and that's kind of missing a big part of the picture. Obviously, they start get, they graduate, they get into theta as well as they get into time decay. So, but those are still the two primary things they focus on. Vega comes far down the camp, even though they're trading it, whether they know it or not. So, I think learning to see things beyond those those limited demarcations was probably the biggest thing I learned that I take with me to this day and as an options. Uh, trade. I probably could go on as well, Mike. Or Mike, <laughs> I could go on as well. I look at the name. Michael asked a question. Nick is my cohort here. Uh, Nick, I'll give you. I'll give you. We got a lot of. We got time for about one more. We got a couple bunch of questions here. I'll let you choose. Do you want to talk iron condors versus iron flies? You want to see the biggest option with the retail crowd, or you want to talk uh, Bitcoin for our last question? What do you want to do? Ah. Uh... Well, let's go to that last Bitcoin question because that's sort of a funny, it's a little bit of a funny question. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's do it. Uh, you got to have one Bitcoin on the show, right? In fact, I was at an event yeah. last night, Nick, and they did say that um, they're, uh, I think it was the CFTC is viewing Bitcoin as a commodity. So it's appropriate we have it on the show then. There we go. We have the approval from the CFTC. It is indeed a commodity. So keep your questions coming to Twifo, at least until we get a, some sort of crypto show on our network, which seems like everyone is a buzz about. So maybe that'll happen uh, one of these days. All right, let's, this one is an interesting one. He says, L, L. Locke says, mine or not to mine? Do you guys recommend mining Bitcoin before trading it? And that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, funny, I was just talking to someone at the big FIA conference last week, a guy I've known for a while who's an options guy, who's gotten into uh, the mining scene pretty actively in the last year or so. And he was kind of laying it out for me and how, uh, I'm not that familiar with it, quite frankly. And so he was kind of laying it out for me in some interesting ways and kind of explaining how in some ways, if you're savvy with options and a former market maker, there's a lot of analogies to be made between what's going on now in that scene and some of the strategies you could use uh, to uh, to inform your mining. Because at the end of the day, you're finding these coins. You, know, you could actually you know find some sort of fair value for these. What's, which coin is worth your time to mine versus others and how to hedge that effectively. So if you have some options wherewithal, some options savvy, there are no obviously listed real options on these contracts yet. But you can have a you can do a little bit better as a miner. So it certainly sounds, and, and they also said that you know the miners certainly have you know, much more, uh, you know, power in that marketplace in terms of, you know, what they, they have a little more insight to what's going on than just the traders and themselves. So it sounds like, you know, that might be a good starting point. And as you start, you know, mining some Bitcoins, you start laying them off, and you start to get a feel for how these things flow. And then you kind of go from there. Who knows? Maybe that's your next career hopping around to uh, Bitcoin mining. I know the thing for that is if you're going to do that uh, power, it's all about power consumption. So find a place with cheap power. Somewhere, hopefully in the middle of nowhere, he's got to have some connectivity and then get a nice good power rate, and then you're off to the races. Mr. Nick, what do you say here? And is this the next uh, evolution for Quick Strike? Are you going to become a Bitcoin miner as well? Yeah, the reason I thought I wanted uh, us to talk about it is because that's the big thing. You have to have uh, access to some cheap power to in order to do such a thing. So to just say you're going to start mining is uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a intensive process to do that. And I know a few people that do it, but you know, it costs it cause you got to do a lot of calcs, a lot of things going on to make that happen. So it's a easier question to just say, 
than just a yes or no. I think, I mean, a harder question than just a yes or no. You have to, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into mining, uh, not just saying I'm going to mine, you know, like you said, you got to have access to some things that the regular person may not necessarily have access to. They know a few Bitcoin miners out there in the burbs, eh? Are they, are they doing well these days? Yeah, not in the burbs, out on the East coast. Uh, I mean, they've, uh, uh, they've, I don't know that they're doing it so much anymore I, for the particular, you know, for the particular reason that it's difficult to do. Right. So I know, I know early on it might've been a little bit less difficult, but I think now it's just getting tougher. So, um, I can't, I don't really know how they're doing, but if they stop doing it, I, I think it's gotta be matter whether it's cost effective or not. Anyway, that's a hard question to say yes, yes or no to. I think there's a lot that goes into it. Let's just say yes for fun. Cause it's fun. All right. <laughs> Let's put a stamp on it. Yes. Uh, that's what we do here, Nick. We deal in absolutes. There are no grades. Now, of course, there are a lot of nuances too. And you're right. It is a challenging thing. Now, uh, the costs are there. You have to, I think you have to be a little bit, you can't just go into Bitcoin. You have to look at some of these alternative currencies. Uh, they seem to be a little bit more fruitful from a mining perspective. But of course, the more esoteric you get, the more risk that a currency is kind of just going to end up being nothing, you know, in terms of regulation or anything else or not liquid. It's a lot of issues that go into it. So it's, yeah, it's not quite, uh, quite the thing. In fact, I heard an interesting story last night, Nick, speaking of mining at this event I was at about someone who back in the day, I think Bit was the Bitcoin miner just for fun. And they had amassed somewhere on the order of 10,000 Bitcoins back when it was, you know, a couple bucks each. So it was value, but it wasn't a ton of, it wasn't, you know, ridiculous money like it is now. Then apparently they had them all on a hard drive and they threw that hard drive away. <laughs> and so now they're paying people like 10 bucks an hour to dig through a landfill to find this machine that has tens of million dollars worth of Bitcoin on it. <laughs> so there you go. Don't let that be you. <laughs> the world of story. If you're going to mine Bitcoin, keep control. It's a digital asset, remember. You lose that key, that's it. You're out. So uh, bear that in mind. But a lot of fascinating stuff. I got the feeling it's not the last time we're going to talk about Bitcoin. This is the last time, unfortunately, we're going to do it on this episode. Because that music means we're done. When we get the Bitcoin question, Nick, that means probably we're done. Uh, but before we go, like I mentioned, a lot of new cool educational stuff over there at CME Group. So while you're over there, cmegroup.com slash twifo. Click around, you see some new, great new educational initiatives on the future side, as well as, of course, on the options. You can find the options stuff over there at the CME Institute and the future stuff for pros out there as well. A lot of interesting stuff out there. And Mr. Nick, before we go, you guys are always cooking up cool stuff in a quick strike. What's coming on the pike from you guys this week? What's coming out in the pike? Let's see. Uh, we got a bill going out this week. Um, yeah, out in, if you're a CME Direct user, you sh if you're not, you should be. We just released a couple real nice tools in the, uh, as part of the integrated version of things, meaning um, we have the block trade browser and the product browser out there. You can get some good info from both of those. We also did a uh, integrated preview release at QuickFall within the direct platform as well. So, um, and I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago and last week as well, uh, QuickFall is now out there as part of QuickStrike Essentials. And that's um, a one month look at all of the stuff we talk about from a historical volatility standpoint. So something to pay attention uh, to and utilize because I think there's some good stuff and you can decide whether you wanna, you know, move to the, to the bigger versions. Um, so that's about it. I would say if you wanna, the best free preview of Quick Strike that you can get right now is um, is on CME Direct. So I would, if, if people are trading and you're trading futures and futures options, go out there and download that and get going and get on the chat there because now that aim is gone and it, it's now integrated with Reuters chat. There's and there's also a new feature within uh, CME Direct called Ask QS where you could type in a, a a command, a question, and it'll bring back that data for you right from the platform. So a lot of good stuff happening out there. There you go. Check it out over there at the CME Direct. If you're not using that, go to cmegroup.com slash twifo and check it out there. Either way, great places to kick the tires and light the fires, as they like to say. And on behalf of Mr. Nick and our friends over there at CME Group and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in such great and many and varied and thematic this week, thematic questions. Keep them coming. And we'll see you next week for more this week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. 
Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 